Hi everyone, my name is Charlie and today I have the E is for Ending book tag. I was tagged by Sarah over at Hardcover Hearts and this tag was created by Sean the Book Maniac. It's been a while since I was tagged to do this and I have just spent near half an hour trying to find books to go with these prompts. So I say we dive straight in. Our first prompt is E is for Ending. A book with a great one, and one whose ending sucked. Avoid spoilers, or at least warn us if you can't. A book with a great ending that is also a series with a great ending is Strange Ever After by Susan Dennard. This was Dennard's first series before the Witchlands books, and was my first introduction into her work way back when. I remember I would get these books on publication day and I'd read them straight through because they were just so compulsive and they were doing things in the YA genre that I hadn't seen done before. This book was published in 2014 and was the end of a series that I had come to recognise an author who didn't mind torturing her characters. This book has an ending that I didn't necessarily want but was the ending that was suitable for the series and made complete sense as to where Dennard was taking the series as a whole and it was the first time in a YA series where I'd seen risks being taken, actions having consequences and a bunch of characters that you couldn't help but love and adore their journeys and sometimes it was torturous because you couldn't bear what was happening to these characters but I still really appreciate what Dennard was doing with this book. It also went to Egypt and Eleanor Fitt has long stuck in my head as a grand heroine because of her actions and the way she behaved and what she fought for and I think at the time the one reason people weren't reading this was because they were comparing it a lot to the Infernal Devices by Cassandra Clare and that's what they were looking for. There really is no comparison, the Something Strange and Deadly series is just brilliant and I wish more people knew about it and read these books. Meanwhile, a book with a not so great ending is How Saints Die by Carmen Marcus. I really liked this book up until the page 305 mark. There had been no hint, no foreshadowing that this was the way that the book was going to go and I think that you're ending has to really suit the story and it felt like the ending here had just been attached to the attached to the end like some sort of epilogue that was completely unnecessary and that's why I say when reading this book stop at page 300 because the climax there is the best climax for the story and it really is more suitable. I think that this was a case of an author who had planned a certain type of ending uh, and failed to recognise that her story had taken her in a different direction so that that ending no longer felt suitable to the story that had been told before. I kept the book despite the fact that I didn't like the ending because I'd enjoyed everything leading up to that and I just wished that it had been wrapped up better than it was in here. E is for elderly, a favourite or memorable elderly character. And for this I am going with Lillian Boxfish from Lillian Boxfish Takes a Walk by Kathleen Rooney. I read this book a few years ago. It reminded me of A Christmas Carol in the way that this character was reflecting on their life and the way that they were walking through New York, really seeing the ghosts from their past but also the ghosts of a city that they no longer recognised. Lillian Boxfish is just such a brilliant character and you spend all this time in her head recognising just what a strong figure she is and how forthright she is and how she's able to recognise her wants and needs and how to get what she wants. Even though the character doesn't exist, I found her like something of an icon. Next we have E is for EU, your favourite contemporary writer post-World War II to now from the European Union and and or one you'd like to try. I went a bit different with this and went for a graphic novelist and artist who also does French comic books and that is Johan Safar. You will have seen me mention his graphic novels on the channel before but we have The Rabbi's Cat, Dungeon, which is a riff on 
Dungeons and Dragons and apparently inspired Adventure Time. The Professor's Daughter and Sardine in Outer Space. This one is a comic book that was aimed more towards children. The entire series of, I think there's six or seven little novels like this can be read in a day and just filled a beano-shaped hole in my life that I didn't know was there before. But the book that I want to talk about most is the Rabbi's Cat Bar, again, by Johann Spar, simply because this is the book that introduced me to his work. Basically follows this cat who, upon gaining the ability to speak, immediately begins to tell lies, goes into questions about religion and philosophy. I have read and reread this book, watched the film, and whilst the art style isn't for everyone, I really just appreciate for the story that is being told, and I think that that's something that the writer does well is he introduces you to these big questions in books like this but is also able to look at popular media with books like this which is a take on the classic mummy film and he turns it into a romance novel. Whilst I read this it felt very much like a carry-on film and um, spoilers here Queen Victoria gets thrown into the River Thames. Fantastic. He seems to have a really weird, kooky sense of humour that is suited to these sorts of books. And I haven't yet read any more of the Dungeon series, but it's something I want to rectify because I do just adore everything of his that I've read so far. And I think that if you want to get into graphic novels, then you couldn't go wrong than reading The Rabbi's Cat. I just really appreciate this writer's work. Even though I don't know many writers in the European Union and that is an issue that I need to rectify, I had a look at the International Booker Prize and I found a book called Till or Tile by Daniel Kalman translated by Ross Benjamin and I believe it's currently shortlisted for the International Booker Prize and when I read what this book was about I discovered a book that I really want to read so there's one I'd like to explore in future. E is for E. A writer you'd recommend whose first and or last name begins with E. I misunderstood the assignment and I got you two writers here, one whose first name begins with E and one whose second name begins with E. So the first one is Eowyn Ivy with The Snow Child. Admittedly, I haven't read her next book. This was a book that I was reading a writing magazine in the doctor's waiting room. And this is way back when I was still at uni as well, was this 2012? Yes, 2012. I was reading about this book in Writing Magazine and it sounded right up my street. Fairy tale retelling set in a snowy landscape, blending in a new narrative. I read all about how this author came to write this book and saw the date the book was coming out and it was that day. So got my mother to take me to Waterstones and they had to go upstairs to get copies and I waited for about 20 minutes because they had to find out whether it was embargoed and it wasn't and I bought it and I began it straight away and I started telling everyone at uni about it. There's even a blog post by one of my tutors asking whether this was the book that I was talking about because at the time I had a big thing for fairy tale retellings. And this one is one that shouldn't be missed because it still has beautiful prose telling a rather human story that I think everyone can appreciate. I was planning on unhauling this book at the end of last year because I've thought about rereading it every Christmas and I've never done it. Then I read the first page and was captivated again and so even though I haven't reread it since I have fond memories of this one and I probably should have read their second book by now. An author whose surname begins with E is Akwaiki Imezi and I read Freshwater last year. I haven't read any of the author's other books but that's another thing I need to rectify. I don't think that this book was necessarily for me but it has a lot in it that I appreciate. It talks about spirits and the body, discusses gender in such a way that this is a book that really I think I need to reread to properly appreciate and go over just what the author was trying to do because I believe this book is actually really smart and it's one of the reasons that it stayed on my shelves because whilst I may have not understood everything the writer was getting at, I think that their way of writing is superb and I remember it having an extraordinarily strong character voice with all these different characters telling the story of a body. So I will be going back to this one at some point. E is for exploration, a new writer, theme or genre you'd like to try. I tend to read widely as it is, read from every genre, read tons of writers. However, something I've always steered clear from 
is what is often called women's contemporary fiction and when I was younger got referenced a lot in the newspapers as chiclet and this is something that was used to define it as something that was unsuitable for real readers. These were books by Sheila O'Flanagan, Marion Keyes and Katie Ford, those kinds of books. Even Jill Mansell and who was the one who ha wrote me, Jojo Moyes. Until these books gained some sort of popularity and were made into films, they had very stereotypical cupboards. Um, which were just stock photos. It's only over the last few years that they've begun to move away from that and try and make the books look somewhat different. However, I think that that stigma towards those books has stuck in my mind and so it's something that I would like to, it's something that I'd like to change and maybe even throw a Maeve Binchy in there as well because these are books that were constantly being portrayed as just being quick beach reads with with little thought behind them without any artistic merit or any merit to be read by real readers and I would like to try and dispel that by reading some of those books myself. E is for Etu Brut, a book in which betrayal plays a central role. For this we have Patsy by Nicole Dennis Benn. I read this book in February and it fast became a new favourite of mine. I read it slowly and I thought at first that that would detract from the book, but actually I think that that was the best way for me to fully immerse myself in the world that the writer was trying to create. The betrayal here happens and is talked about in the blurb in that Patsy decides to leave her life and her daughter behind in Jamaica to travel to America for her long lost love. She has previously told her daughter True that she would move to America with her. She starts it by saying that she's going to go to America with her daughter and then she's going to then it comes and she's going to America on her own, but she's saying that she'll send for her daughter at some point. And slowly Patsy begins to realise that the world she thought was waiting for her in New York is actually worse than the one that she had back in Jamaica and that the world is completely different and it isn't this idealised sanctuary that she has so often seen and she becomes this undocumented citizen and it deals with that betrayal and the uh, betrayal of Patsy's long lost love, it deals with Patsy's betrayal of her daughter and then it deals with the betrayal of this American dream and how dreams so often don't match the reality. And so, Patsy, if you haven't read it yet, you really ought to because it's it's a strong one. E is for Exception, a book that you loved or really liked in spite of it containing what you almost always consider a fatal flaw. For this, I chose The Trouble with Goats and Sheep. I looked at my shelves and one thing I always do in my reviews is I talk about the good and the bad because I don't give star ratings and I don't like attributing numbers to books because I recently mentioned it in my book true prize video. It's difficult for me to rank books because they always mean something different and I recognise that what I like other people won't like and so I couldn't very well figure out how to rate books. With The Trouble with Goats and Sheep I have christened this book my favourite book. It does everything that I adore. It has a really strong voice, it reminds me of Alan Benny, it reminds me of classic British comedies. These are things that I always talk about when I am recommending this book to people. However, I have never mentioned this before because I don't like to mention it. When I first read it, I did not like the way the book ended. I felt as though we were given the resolution and then we had this chapter thrown in to give us a bit of an epilogue but I constantly gave my support to this book and then detractors, friends I have who didn't like the book would come to me and they talk about the ending and I would agree with them. That I don't think it's the strongest ending and that's a thing you get a lot with debut novels and it's something I've struggled with myself is that you either end the story too late or you end the story too early. It's the whole thing of starting late, finishing early. You don't know where's best to end the story. You have a finish point in mind but sometimes a point will come along and you're like oh no here's the end of the story and that's a moment that I had with An Heir to Murder myself was like do I end this book here and that's why you get the ending that you get with that book because I felt that that was the best place to end the story. With this book here I feel like what you have to do is you have to read the book the whole way through and recognise that you get all the answers. You don't have to wait until the end of the answers. The ending has, the resolution has happened slowly throughout the book and so that the story doesn't, the story seems to end abruptly but it's not ending abruptly. What it's doing is 
it's just emphasising that these characters' lives are going to continue. And whilst it might not seem like the best ending over time, I recognise that it is the best ending for the book and the story that is being told. E is for E, 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 E. A book title with lots of E's. I could not find one on my shelves to save my life. I was looking at any book that had an E in it and I just couldn't do it so I went with the classic East of Eden by John Steinbeck. This is a book that I still haven't read but everyone knows that John Steinbeck is one of my favourite authors at this point. I still mean to go and get his entire library of books because I've read quite a few of them now, it's just the really thick ones that I've avoided and East of Eden is probably his most famous work. I remember there was a booktuber back in the day who talked about it being their favourite book and yeah, I really just need to knuckle down, find myself a copy and get it read. Next we have E is for Ever Present, a book you read a long time ago that has really stuck with you. And for me that book is The Lollipop Shoes by Joanne Harris. I've talked about this book before in the way back in 2008. I asked for the book Rune Marks by Joanne Harris. That was a book that was written for the teenage market. It's a book that is set after Ragnarok and discusses Norse mythology. It's a fantastic book, it's got its flaws but I really appreciated it and mean to go back one day and give it a reread as well as its sequel Rune Lie that I still haven't read because the original editions have horrible covers. The covers now match the Gospel of Loki and the Testament of Loki but those books did not do that. My mother saw the lollipop shoes at the same time, recognised it was the same author and decided to get me this as a surprise. And back in the day I thought this was women's fiction, I thought that this was only for women and then I talked about how there was a line for the bathroom and so I just started reading it and the first line got me that much that this became my favourite book that I'd got that Christmas. It surpassed the other books that I'd got and was my first foray into adult literature as well. I reread and reread this book that year. We had to write like some fan fiction for our English language class at A level and I sent a message to Joanne Harris to ask a question about this book. I have bends in the spine because my teacher took it and photocopied it and cracked the spine and I've never forgiven her. The Lollipop Shoes introduced me to one of my favourite writers and this has been the only book probably from my teenage years that is still on my shelves today. Um, this and the Harry Potter books. It's just because this book introduced me to one of my favourite writers and I finally got to see magic in fiction in the everyday. Joanne Harris really knows her stuff, knows how to tell a tale and my adoration knows no bounds for that woman, for that writer, for everything that they do. E is for Eliminate, a group of books you got rid of or want to and why. I regularly unhaul books. If you have seen me talk about a book on my channel that I didn't like, that book will no longer be on my shelves. Apart from these few here because as you know we're all currently under some conditions where we have to stay home and because of that some of the books I dislike are still here. The first two that I want to talk about are here because I kept them because they were booktube prize books and I wanted to discuss them in my wrap up. So those books are A Single Thread by Tracy Chevalier and The Dutch House by Anne Patchett. When I get the opportunity both of these books will be leaving my home. I did consider keeping A Single Thread because for the most part I did enjoy Tracy Chevalier's writing and I always knew I'd be unhauling Anne Patchett even when I bought the book because me and this lady's writing style we just don't get on and that's okay. And the first time I ever used my Society of Authors discount was on Crescent City House of Earth and Blood by Sarah J Mass, and that sickens me. I bought this book because of the hype and we all know why I'm getting rid of it. E is for everyone. Tag extensively. There are people that I want to tag but I don't know whether they've already done this video and also I don't know whether they actually know I exist. Um, so if you're watching this video and I haven't mentioned your name here then please do feel free to consider yourself tagged. However I've written a list and so we're going to go for the usual suspects here and they are Sophie over at Redhead Reading, Emily at Novel Novels, Emma of Emma Rose and Books, Dane of Dane Reads and Cat of Brews and Reviews. If you've already done it, let me know. Tell me. Send me a link to your video. And as I say, if you want to do this, do it. Fill your boots. Them's the books. I hope that I have introduced you to some writers you might not have previously known about. If you've read any of these books and would like to discuss them, please feel free to do so in the comments. I hope you've enjoyed this video and until next time, that is all.